Good morning, everybody. Um, it is April 17, and I believe this is week 14 of the course. And we've, we've wrapped up our occurrence data segment. And this week is a segment unto itself with, with essentially a brief um, comment on an illustration of visualization of these things. So we want to think about visualization of environmental spaces. We want to think about visualization of the occurrence data. Uh, and so Luis Escobar uh, did us the favor of, of providing a couple of talks on that topic, summarizing a lot of work that he's done with, with Huijie Chiao in, in China. Um, so uh, Luis uh, and Marlon Cobos and Mona Papage are here with us. Maybe somebody else will join us, maybe not. Um, let's go ahead and jump into questions. Uh, but So Luis, I'm going to share my screen and then I'm going to give people a quick orientation as to where we are in this thing. So everybody, here we are in week 14. And again, it's a, it's a unit unto itself. Next week, we start into distributional equilibrium. And we're going to do that via talks from Jorge Soberon and Fernando Machado. And then the, the week after, I'll give some, some reflections on uh, BAM and M. So we'll be talking kind of the next two weeks on distributional equilibrium. And then finally, we get into modeling algorithms. So uh, those of you who have been impatiently sending questions like, yes, but how do I uh, calibrate my model? We're almost there. Please, just be patient with us. We're going to take seven months to do this course. And so we can't start it with the questions that are forefront in everybody's mind. So Luis, uh, questions that you would like to answer? Um, again, give me line numbers and I will navigate to them. Uh, <clears throat> mm -hmm. I don't, uh, okay. I don't have. You don't have the I, line numbers? No, because I. <laughs> okay, uh, you go ahead and just read the question and um, and start into your answer, but read the question so that we know what you're what you're asking about. Cool. Uh, uh, first of all, thank you, Tom, for for organizing this. I know that a lot of participants are super happy and engaged with the course, uh, and it's a good relief in terms of the COVID nineteen. And uh, one question is related to um, um, I don't. Uh, is related to the standardization of variables when we are using niche A uh, in two dimensions or in three dimensions, and why to do the uh, why to uh, standardize the variables? Well, you can use the original variable that you are using for your modeling uh, to to see your data in niche A. Um, you can use the, the the temperature, the the remote sensing data that you are using for your models. And if you do a, PC, a principal component analysis and you have new variables you, in, from another software, you can use those variables in each A. Uh, the suggestion of doing a standardization is that sometimes you are going to see a cluster, a very small cloud of data. And that's why we suggest to do a, a standardization so you can like, like do a zoom in into that cloud and see much better your data. Um, another question. Uh, um, Before you go on, let's, let's reflect on that just a bit. Uh, think about it. There are, there are um, some dimensions where if you use the raw scores or the raw values, they're going to be very compressed just because of the, uh, the values involved. The principal components analysis has the advantage of essentially giving each dimension values in, in proportion to the variance that's explained. 
And so you may have quite a bit more ability to view the, the true dimensions of the variation. But you should think about whether standardized or unstandardized is better for you. Some kinds of standardization, like a z-standardization, might take an axis that has very little variance or explains very little variance and expand it artificially. So I think it's, a, it's something where you need to think very carefully about uh, what it is you're trying to visualize. Is it that you're trying to see the, the array of values along a particular, um, a particular axis? Or is it that you wanna see the overall variation across all the axes, in which case you might want them scaled by how much variation they explain? That seem fair, Luis? Yes, sir. Marlon, Mona, thoughts? Not on this question. <laughs> Luis, another question. 1887, line 1887. Uh, this is related to the use of uh, categorical variables in each A. Um, the question is if we can use um, categorical variables, and the answer is no, you cannot. Um, uh, and at least for this software, uh, we only can use continuous variables. And that's my answer. Um, we'll come back to this, but categorical variables are very rarely used in niche modeling. Now, you may want to visualize your data with categorical vari variables, but they, as far as using them as inputs into a modeling exercise, it's very rare that they get used. And my experience is that the programs use them in a, in a, in a fairly clunky and useless manner, uh, which is to say, you know, for example, if you put categorical vari variables into Maxent, which you can do, <clears throat> my experience is that a category that has a very small spatial extent will tend to get turned on completely if there's even one or a few points in it. So I think in general, you don't want to use categorical variables, although there certainly may be um, situations where you would like to do some visualization separating into different categories. Yeah, it may be useful like to visualize your data in those kind of variables when you when you have uh, like your goal you want, when your goal is to focus on the distribution and your occurrences provide like they come from a well developed sampling and all that, which is very difficult to have. Uh, later, if you really want to use those variables, you can use them after modeling, not necessarily during the modeling. Uh, there is another, Mona, do you want to say something? You can go ahead. I, I, I'm scrolling to the questions. <laughs> There is one question uh, in, I, I, I don't have the line number, but it's about uh, something I said in my presentation about kernel density uh, and about um, if niche A is only for data visualization and what is a virtual species? The three in the same question. Um, imagine, for, to answer the first one, kernel density estimation, imagine that you are in a GIS software and you want to do a convex school or a density analysis to see, uh, to do like a heat map, or you can do also a cluster analysis. All these analysis in geographic space, you can also do those analysis in the environmental space. And not only in two dimensions, in several dimensions. So some of the examples in visualization, in the presentation were, were related to how can we see a Maxent model in environmental space versus a kernel density model uh, or a cluster analysis? Everything done in environmental space. So this is not only a 
uh, an algorithm we can use to estimate uh, species distributions uh, and the package in R is hypervolume. For, related to, to, um, to uh, the uses of niche A, niche A is not only for data visualization, actually the origins uh, are related to the development or the design of virtual species. Imagine that you want to develop a model uh, and you need to have really good data and you want to know if the species is in ecological equilibrium, the biases in the data, uh, so you can control everything if you design your own species. So in niche A, you can develop your species by designing the, the shape of the fundamental niche or the realized niche uh, using some controls that you're going to see in the, in the right or also writing the parameters. So my species is going to have this shape of the res or response to temperature. So th these are the limits. Uh, so uh, I guess that to me, niche A is one of the strongest tools to develop virtual species. And in terms of data visualization, there are other, other really good options. Um, and what is a virtual species? Um, as I was saying, virtual species are those used generally when you want to test a method, not like the uh, specific range of, of, uh, of, of some taxa, but what mm, the, the algorithms are doing to predict the, the species distribution. So we should probably point out that, you know, these visualizations can, can be done in other programs. There are lots of platforms ranging from, you know, R and, and um, even Excel, where you can visualize your data. Um, doing it in three dimensions gets harder. And so when Hui Jie Chiao set out to build Niche, it was mainly because he was frustrated with, um, with how unavailable or unfriendly were the tools for visualizing things in three dimensions, whatever it may be. Um, so, so again, there are, there are lots of ways to do this, uh, but Nietzsche is particularly convenient and is also particularly customized to the sorts of things you may wish to do uh, as, you, as you develop niche models. Um, I, I just want to add the, the, oh, sorry, Mona. No, no, go ahead. Uh, visualization in 3D, it, it can be really informative, especially in environmental space. You're going to see that some of your occurrences are more extreme than others. And those, uh, those explorations are important because they will tell you <clears throat> how well uh, an algorithm can predict those occurrences in case you're not using them or how variable can be the environmental conditions that the species use. So it, it, it gives you uh, a general idea of how how wide the niche of the species can be, uh, and it's it's apart from how in the geography the species is distributed. So that that's one important thing about visualizations and doing it in more than two dimensions is informative because of the ability that the program has to show you not only one dimension of the niche but all more than that that relationship is important the niche of the species is not a square in variables but is something that co-varies with with different variables at least that's what we believe and and you know the difference between one dimension and two is huge the difference between two dimensions and three is huge and the difference between three and four and five, that's awfully hard to know. But I mean, uh, they're obviously important. They're probably less and less important just because the numbers of relevant dimensions in the environmental world is probably not a huge number. It's probably not thousands or hundreds. It may be tens. Um, so it's all, it's all important and useful. 
and yet it gets harder and harder to do. And you know, if you've taken a three-dimensional figure and rotated it and moved it around, you realize, oh, there were things I did not see or I could not see in two dimensions that I can see in three. And I assume the same is going on beyond that, but human perception is not very good beyond three dimensions. Let's take a, a stab at this question that I, I highlighted. I think it's, it's an interesting one that will also take us um, kind of into future comments. Uh, my question is, if the minimum volume ellipsoid encompasses, encompasses almost all of the points of the environmental background, are my data not suitable for modeling? Aha, very good question. Um, so let's make some basic assumptions. One assumption is that your environmental background is based on a robust hypothesis of the accessible area, what we call M in the BAM diagram. We're going to talk about that next week. But let's imagine that, that this is genuinely a, a, uh, a set of sites, the environmental background corresponds to a set of sites that is the set of sites that the species has been able to explore and potentially colonize over relevant time periods. And let's assume that you've done a good job in cleaning up your data, okay? If you have a species with a nice, well-defined, compact niche, and you have occurrence points that fall in that niche, then you're going to get a good compact ellipsoid. But if you have some errors, then a minimum volume ellipsoid will tend to overestimate the true volume of the niche. So I'm just going to assume that you've delimited your environmental background based on an M hypothesis. And I'm going to assume that you've cleaned up all of the um, the, the potential errors in your occurrence data set. Now it's an interesting question. Um, I'll put up a paper by, that was led by Aaron Saup uh, and a bunch of other people. Um, but Saup et al. 2012, um, essentially what it shows is that if you have a configuration of the BAM diagram in which the entire accessible area is also suitable, then you are essentially unable to make a rigorous set of contrasts that would allow fitting a niche model. So you can imagine this as, you know, some small island and a species that's a generalist species is able to colonize that island and uh, eventually differentiates just because of isolation. But our species is able to live in every single environment on that island. Well, that would give a situation like what we're talking about here. The reason why you're not gonna be able to develop a, a, a predictive model of the niche is because all these, these approaches depend on some sort of contrast between the conditions where the species is known and the, species, the conditions where the species is not known. Now that's the, the classic one. So if you were using a, a linear model or an additive model, then you have you know, basically a contrast between yes points and no points. And in your situation, you do not have that contrast. In like a Maxent situation, well, you're contrasting the presence points versus the background. But in this case, the background is all suitable. And so you're not going to be able to develop a model that, that discriminates. And finally, with something like um, a range rule or what they used to call bioclim models, um, or an, an, essentially what, you're, what you would be then doing is saying, well, my range is from this to this, but that's also the range 
over which you've been able to see the species. And so you don't know if this limit is here or here or far, much farther. So in general, if your uh, accessible area is all suitable, no, you can't develop a model and you should be willing just to walk away from the study. Uh, I guess that there could be some situations in which you have the background that is the same size of your niche or, or the cloud of environment of occurrence points. And maybe your question is, uh, where are the locations or in terms of continuous maps, where are the sites that are in the center of, of that ellipsoid, for example? So in that case, you are going to see a map with different hotspot of of high values that are the center of the ellipsoid, for example. But because everything that's accessible to our species is within its niche, then we don't know what the limits of the niche are, and so we don't know where the centroid is. Yeah, it depends. Depending on the type of ellipsoid, you can, you can even have uh, ellipsoids that are larger than the background, the entire background you have. And, and that's a, a complication if you want to use any algorithm that considers either like absences or background or pseudo absences. But uh, the episode can give you at least an idea of how suitable some conditions can be. That's an advantage of ellipsoids, but it's a disadvantage as well in terms of like being, uh, how can I say, being uh, more rigorous models as well. Uh, it depends. As Tom said, if your final goal is to decide whether an area is suitable or not, you rather would like to go with an approach that is more empirical and just take the entire island or whatever the region is and start removing uh, areas you know that are not good for the species like cities or like farms or stuff like that. So did somebody highlight line 1897? Yes, I did that. So you can respond that question. And another that is uh, in the end, and um, it's related to why niche models cannot be used to differentiate species limits. Because I guess that there was some misunderstanding in terms of range limits. And when I was talking about how differentiate species limits using niche, a niche approach, uh, and basically what I was doing is explaining that maps could be, could look very different in the location, the range of species. Um, but if we see them in environmental space, they overlap. So we cannot use niche models to say, okay, this is one species and this is another. So there are some, some questions related to what species limits and, and what's, why niche models may not be a good tool for estimating. Yeah, I'll, I'll put up a paper uh, done a few years ago that, uh, that talks about essentially why using niche modeling and niche model comparisons to make decisions or to make recommendations about the limitation of species, not species range limits, but what is a species versus what are two species, why it's a pretty weak approach. Uh, and very simply, um, having the same niche is a shared ancestral character. And we usually delimit species based on derived characters. And so we have lots and lots and lots of species that are different species in spite of having uh, the same niche. Okay, in fact, I would say the dominant pattern is that closely related like sister species will have the same niche. And so we definitely don't have much power to discriminate. Uh, and then if two forms have different niches and they're not in close geographic contact, we also don't really use that as a way of discriminating between species. 
So it's really only if you had two populations that are in contact and yet have a distinct ecological niche that you could say something about species limits, taxonomic limits of species. So if you think about it as um, a two by two matrix where you have same niche, different niche, and geographic contact or not geographic contact, of the four cells in that two by two matrix, only one of them is informative. But I'll put up a paper on opossums that, that you may find interesting in that regard. Um, we, can we um, address a question that's maybe uh, just marginally related to visualization? Um, that's and that's fine. because, so line 1929, the, the caveat is that I, I scroll through the slides. Luis, I didn't listen to your, <laughs> to your, uh, to your recording. Um, but so I don't know if in your, in your presentation, you talked about um, quantifying similarity between models. So this question says it could be a good approach, or it's a question, could it be a good approach to evaluate the similarity between two models with Schoner's, Schoner's D metric? So I don't know if you discussed um, similarity. Uh, so I don't know if it's in that context. Um, uh yeah, and that question is, is also below, <laughs> similar. Uh, yes, I was explaining. I, I didn't address that very well, uh, but yes, you can assess similarity of niches in a space with niche A, because let's imagine that you have one model and you have another model. What you can do in niche A is to see how much they overlap in environmental space. Uh, we have done that uh, with nice results. And the, the difference with this metric that is here is that the software uh, in which the shorteners D metric is implemented is in geographic space. Something we saw is that in geographic space, maybe the two metrics are very associated. But when the overlap is small, let's imagine that these are maps. This is geographic space and these are nations, OK? <laughs> In, in geographic space, and the, there is a strong overlap between two species, uh, the two metrics uh, are the same. But if there is a small overlap in geographic space, for example, uh, the Schoener D metric underestimates. Because in geographic, in environmental space, what we see is that even when there is a tiny geographic overlap, maybe this tiny geographic overlap is a lot of the uh, of two ellipsoids. Um, the geographic area that is not overlapping maybe is only a single point in environmental space. So this duality is very challenging, and that's why we suggest to develop metrics in geographic and environmental space. Yeah, and and I I don't know if the this uh, the the person who asked this question is uh, familiar with the ENM tools. Um, Warren's, uh, Dan Warren's tool. So maybe that's why he was asked, he or she, sorry, Alejandro, he, uh, he was asking this question. Um, and I will admit limitation of knowledge here. My knowledge of ENM tools has stopped uh, like two years or three years ago before uh, Dan Warren uh, released the uh, R package that, that I think does now because you're right, the ENM tools and Schoner's D was limited to or was based on geographic overlap, not environmental overlap. But I, I had a conversation with Dan, and again, this was almost three years ago. <laughs> uh, he had a poster, and I had a conversation with Dan, and, and he was telling me that the, the R package that he developed was addressing this, was or was expanding this, this Schoner's D uh, the similarity, the overlap metric into environmental space, but again, I have not, I have not attempted to to use his new package. Let's let's play with current events. Oh, Good morning, instructors. <laughs> I want to understand when we want when we want to model any diseases, does it work? Um, it doesn't work on COVID nineteen, especially human. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe there are 
mo other models for humans. I know it works on animals. What about the strains of COVID-19? Does it work on that? So this, this is a really interesting question. Uh, and in fact, it's been the subject of a pretty intensive debate um, in the niche modeling world in, in recent days. Um, let's think about COVID-19. It's a, it's a phenomenon that is, that is, at this point, exclusively in humans. Yes, the virus came probably from some mammal, probably from some East Asian bat maybe via an intermediate host. But the virus right now is held in humans and all of the cases that are, that are welling up around the, the human world are viruses that were previously in a, another human. So first question is, does it, do humans have an ecological niche? And yes, they do. Um, you know, certainly temperatures beyond 100 degrees centigrade or uh, 100 degrees below zero centigrade are outside of our niche. But we have a pretty darn broad niche such that we can live almost anywhere on Earth. But the real question is whether there's any um, niche constraints on the transmission of the virus. And you've all heard that the transmission on the, of the virus takes place on a spatial scale of a meter or two. And so there's a huge scale question because if we want to do any meaningful spatial mapping, we really have to find a way to scale between a meter and what, a kilometer or something like that, which might be the, the minimum uh, or the, the best resolution we could get uh, in terms of mapping environments. That would suppose that there are environmental constraints on whether the virus travels over that space between two human beings. Now there may be, but I'm rock solid certain that it's a very micro, micro scale phenomenon. And then the final thing to comment on is, well, two, two final things to comment on. One is what processes have determined the rapid global spread of this virus? Certainly a dominant process has been human movements, not whether the environments are suitable. Human movements from, you know, if this originated in, in central China in Wuhan, then initially you saw spread uh, within China and, and um, in East Asia. And then you saw these huge jumps like to Europe and to the United States. And then you saw further jumps to, uh, to the rest of the world. And in fact, a recent result, which the president of the country that I'm living in has vehemently denied, a recent result has been that, that oops, the, what he calls the China virus came to the, at least the New York foci in the US, not from China, but from Europe. Anyhow, a dominant process has been movement, not environmental suitability. Final comment, I promise, is that uh, we've talked to, or we're going to talk very soon about distributional equilibrium. And as is completely and patently obvious to everybody in the world, this thing is not in distributional equilibrium yet. It's still spreading or beginning to spread to the most remote and disconnected countries on earth. But even in the US, for example, I'm sitting 
in eastern Kansas. East of us is Kansas City, which has a good number of cases. West of us is mostly rural, and the numbers of cases are very low. And so delimiting what is that accessible area? Yeah, in some senses, it's the whole world. And then in some other senses, it's this very nebulous radius around where there are present cases. So yeah, this is, this is a current event. It's literally probably the largest scale event in my lifetime that has affected humanity. We work with these tools that, that um, can be applied to disease transmission. Luis has been a leader in that area. And yet I think this is a situation where, let's not. The virus has not been spreading long enough for us to call it in equilibrium. And we have all these other complicating factors of scale and of transmission routes. Now maybe, 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 with really good quality data, maybe one could take a region for which you have really good reporting and where the, the virus pandemic or the virus outbreak has done its exponential phase and then tapered off and started to stop. Notice that what I'm after is that it's no longer uh, spreading rapidly. And maybe you could then take into account human density and maybe you could then take into account human movements. And then you could ask the very simple niche model question of are there accessible areas with certain predictable sets of conditions that would allow you to develop the contrasts that might start saying, not under these conditions, which is to say delimiting the niche. Maybe you could do that. I don't think we're anywhere close, if only on the data quality question. What do you all think? Well, I, I was very confused <laughs> when I when I saw first attempts to attempt to do a model of uh, because I like you said I was confused about what what was the point what was the the objective of that model is it modeling the the environmental space of the host of the vector of of the uh, the virus, what is this? And I, I think it's it's very unfortunate that we put very um, hastily <laughs> run models out there uh, in a time when everybody's hungry for information and for for I don't know for positive development. We understand this now and we understand that. Um, and yeah, I was very confused because it doesn't mean. I, yeah, we have to decide what is it that we are modeling before we start modeling anything. And there are so many issues that you, you mentioned that make this situation not, not appropriate for an ecological niche modeling framework. One of the conclusions from um, that initial study, I guess I'll put up a link to it, um, one of the initial conclusions was that humid tropical countries would not be affected. And, you know, I, I was very concerned about that, mainly because, think about it, our outbreak started here, and then for reasons of human interconnection, spread to other regions in East Asia, spread to Europe, and spread to the US. Well, right away we see spread in the temperate zone. 
And just because of connectivity, we might expect Africa, for example, or high northern latitudes to be less connected. And so they might get colonized by the disease later. And so doing something, I think the, the initial data grab for, for the, the niche models, um, doing something as of March 10th might be a bad idea. Just because we're totally out of distributional equilibrium. Anyhow, um, my point is simply, this is a situation where you have to think really, really carefully about all the different um, caveats that you've heard in this, in this course. And before you jump in and you, know, you can grab the data from, uh, from this site or a bunch of sites on GitHub, before you do that, you should probably think carefully about are enough of those assumptions fulfilled that it would be responsible or feasible to get a useful model out of this? I'm trying to see where the, the country by country, there we go. So let's see. I wanna go down to some tropical countries. Okay, but yeah, Brazil has, uh, temperate zone regions. There's Peru. Look at the, the look at this graphic down here. That's telling you the accumulation of cases. Sorry, Marlon. Oh no. And Ecuador. I guess I just need to zoom in in the map with the plus symbol. Well, I'm I'm getting the the curves over here. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so you're trying to show that it's accumulating exponentially. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah I guess that also some of the messages of, of this experience is that if you're going to work in a different taxa or a different system, always try to work with uh, experts in, in, in those pieces of systems so you are aware of the, of the challenges, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've done a lot of disease work over the years, like the last 20 years. And what I've found is that I learn the most and I get the most robust results when I'm working with an expert. And I probably make the biggest mistakes when I'm not working with an expert. So look at these humid tropical countries that I'm highlighting. Now, some of them may appear to be flattening off, but you have to remember also that access to testing is extremely limited. And that can flatten off those curves as well. Maybe the country had a, a shipment from WHO uh, of 500 test kits. Well, when those run out, maybe that flattens the curve. Sorry, Mono, you were going to say something? No, it was Marlon. Ah, yeah, Marlon. I, just, I was going to say that, remember that there is no magical tool for doing anything and that you first have to understand the question, as Mona said, and then decide which tool will be better. Like these kind of questions are probably uh, better to answer or to explore with other more mechanistic approaches that consider many other factors. Yeah, because in this case, it's um, at this point, humans are transmitting it everywhere. It's not, we are not after the uh, wild reservoir. We are not after the vet. It's, it's just human to human transmission. And it has, I mean, in my, humble opinion it has nothing to do with ecological niche modeling at this point it's it's the transmission that is f for the purpose of you know um getting a hold of this pandemic um it has yeah the transmission is critical 
human to human. Um, if if we want to jump back to the questions, I, I, it's ten forty seven. I don't know if we if you want to say more about COVID nineteen modeling or. No, I, I just wanted to point. Me, out. Just, I just want to close. I just want to close to say that this could have a lot of consequences. If you if you publish a preprint, for example, countries like Brazil are, are purchasing medicine based on preprints. Uh, there are clin clinical trials based on preprints. So everything you publish could have consequences. Just that. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I think it's a valid point that you know, and I think all of us have now said it, but. There are cases in which niche modeling is not a useful tool. We talked about, I should have mentioned earlier, a Wallacean species, but that species where the accessible area and the background cloud and the range of the species and its manifestation in environmental space are coincident, you're not gonna get a good predictive model out of that. And cases where the, the species is wildly outside of distributional equilibrium, like COVID-19, I just don't think it's an appropriate tool for the question. Sorry, go ahead, Mona. I'm sorry, I can't find the line number now, but uh, one of the question uh, was, oh, line uh, 1884, what is existential niche? And I also had the question, <laughs> Is it same as potential niche? What is what? Existential? Yes, existential niche. I guess some... Um, I, isn't that the existing niche? Isn't that what the person is referring to? Luis, did you use this terminology yes. in your... Yes, uh -huh. I was showing in the presentation a big ellipsoid with gaps because those climates don't exist. And that's this, the portion of that that actually exists, existential. Sorry. Okay, the, the term that we had used originally for that is existing. Existing. But, but okay. we're, all, we're all crossing language barriers. So, um, so yeah, Maria, this is the existing niche and it is the subset of the fundamental niche that is actually manifested across the accessible area of the species. And that is not the same as potential niche. Um, no, it isn't. Uh, okay. Potential niche is not a term that we use. Potential okay. distribution, yes. Okay. There was a there was a question that is easy to answer, but I, I also cannot find it. It was just <laughs> about saying, how can I visualize my data in environmental and geographic space? And, and the answer is, it's not, it's not that hard. You have some abilities in GIS and Excel at least, but if you, man, if you are like, uh, you have abilities in R, it's gonna be easier. You can visualize both at the time, but there is a nice software. The name is, I don't know how to pronounce it, but Geoda or Geoda. Geoda, yeah. Uh, I send a, a link to that software in the chat so Tom can share it with you. And the nice thing is that you can see at the same time geographic and environmental space, unfortunately only in two dimensions, I guess, in environmental space, but you can see both at the time and you can move things around in those spaces and you're gonna see how things change at the same time. And that's, that's a really nice thing to do when you're exploring data, especially backgrounds and your occurrences. I think the line was 1938, Tom, I think. If you wanna highlight that. Is that the question, Marlon? I think that that was, yeah, the question. Yeah, another, another software that, that, another good software that you can use to see G and E, geographic and environmental space is niche A. <laughs> Actually, there <laughs> I, I didn't have a sp uh, time to show everything, but there is a tool in which you have your occurrence points and the background, uh, but you can open a window with the map and you can make barriers to say, okay, what if I have a river here or a mountain here? And then see what happens in the environmental in the space, how the occurrences split 
uh, or maybe not in environmental space. And any uh, related to the to the problems with some concepts that I that were misused in the presentation, everything is fault of QGHL. So you can send some message. <laughs> That was not very nice, Luis. But <laughs> okay, I think we're going to go ahead and end the question and answer session with Luis's generous and, and <laughs> wonderful expression of friendship. Uh, I, I have to go teach, as you guys know by now, at, at 10, 10 a.m. here. Um, but Marlon, Mona, and Luis, thanks very much for, for joining us and answering questions. And we'll see everybody next week to talk about distributional equilibrium. <laughs> and this is called oh, yeah. video bombing the course. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, I, I just wanted to say hi.